Do you love coffee and Monero as much as we do? Consider making gratuitous.org your daily cup. Pay with Monero for premium fresh beans, and if you like what you taste, send a digital cash tip directly to the Guatemalan farmers that made it possible. Proceeds help us grow this channel, Gratuitous, and Monero. This week on Monero Talk is sponsored by Cake Wallet. Store, send, receive, and exchange your Monero and Bitcoin safely on iOS and Android too. Cake Wallet is open source, and you always control your own keys. And by Sweetwater Digital Asset Consulting, connecting new money with old money since 2018. Cake Wallet and Sweetwater Digital are trusted and verified by the Monero community. Monero Talk is also made possible from contributions by viewers and listeners like you. This week on Monero Talk. From DEF CON 29 in Las Vegas, Douglas Tuman interviews Francisco Cabañas, aka Arctic Mine, a member of the Monero Core team. The two discuss his DEF CON talk about Monero scaling opportunities and challenges. Monero Talk starts now. All right, Francisco. AKA Arctic Mine, how you doing? I'm doing really good. So what's uh, what's your your take on DEF CON so far? This is a little bit of an odd year. We got we got the masks on. Well, it's a DEF CON with masks. Um, it's a bit of a difficulty getting here, getting back to Canada, so that's a major issue. Um, so it kind of slows everything down. There's less people. There's less attendance. But it's a good try. Yeah, Hopefully but overall. Overall, pretty good, right? I'm impressed by the village here, the crypto village. Uh, what's nice is we got to meet a lot of people that actually don't already know about Monero. That's good. And also, we got to meet some of the old people also in person. 18 months is a long time. Too long, too long. I'm looking forward to MoneroCon. Are you gonna, are you going to be at that? Oh yes. When is it? Uh, I think, I don't know. What, what is MoneroCon? I don't know. But it, I think it's I'd like maybe it's a year from now or six months from now? That's what my understanding is. And I think they're thinking Germany, right? I think Germany, yeah. But The, the old idea was uh, to do it in Berlin. And the COVID came in. Mm. So now two years later, we're going to go back to do that. That's good. Yeah, I can't wait. But uh, you gave a great talk today, as always. Um, theme was... Monero scalability, is that correct? Well, not just Monero. Uh, we know Monero scales. It's the issues also in some of the other coins. I mean, Bitcoin has a serious problem with scalability. But even the so-called big blocker coins, they're going to have a big problem with security. And Ethereum has not solved the fee problem. So what I'm most interested in uh, right now in terms of uh, taking advantage of your brain here is how do you feel about the, you know, the recent rise in transactions that we're seeing in Monero? Uh, have you been able to gather any further insight into Monero, given that we're now actually starting to see these high transaction volumes versus things just being theoretical? We're starting to actually see things in action, right? So we, I assume we're, we're seeing dynamic block size actually play out and, and uh, you know, scale up dynamically i mean are you are you getting any uh new insights into what monero was designed to do now that we're actually seeing it happen in the real world okay the first thing we're still in the um a free space zone so we haven't triggered the dynamic block size so we did trigger it uh during the high um fee period with before we went to bulletproofs Okay, my I thought yeah, it was I thought it was recently now, triggered. It wasn't recently it was triggered. Definitely not. Okay. No. It, now, what's happened in Monero over the last um, three years has been a steady increase in transaction rate, roughly equivalent to two and a half to three times a year. So that's basically what we've seen in Monero, and if you take the long-term trend, it's very much, in my opinion, driven by adoption, and the reason I say this is because the price hasn't really done that particularly exciting. So what we're seeing is a lot of straightforward adoption. We saw a bit of a peak just when you would expect it in December. A lot of people were thinking it was um, spam attacks and whatever, but it looked to me a lot like it was just simply a peak in retail adoption ahead of Christmas. 
It's not as measurable. It's not the 24 thing because it's still dominated by speculators and investors, but that's what I'm seeing. Um, and it's a mix, I think, in both uh, uh, regular markets and also the darknet markets. Yeah, we're starting to see a lot of uh, real world use now too, right? So you said back in December, but now it's the, the volume is spiking right now, it seems like, right? Well, I mean, one of the things I mentioned, it could well be uh, uh, Dogecoin just dropped. And I suspect people are using it for things like buying um, prepaid value with stores. Like, uh, and they're using for that. And it, it could just as well move from Dogecoin to Monero because Dogecoin prices went up. Dogecoin historically had a lot of retail transactions that people didn't realize for what it was doing. And the minute the price went up and the fees didn't go up, they went somewhere, and I suspect it might have gone to Monero. Because that's very unusual what we just saw, this flip. Now, the other one that's fallen in transaction rates drastically is Dash, and it's also below Monero. And, and those coin, well, you're saying Doge fell in, in transaction volume primarily because it became very expensive to transact. Oh, yes, absolutely. I mean, the, the, what you had in Doge was a an increase of about 200 times in the price. And they didn't change the minimum node relay fee. So you had a 200-fold increase in the node relay fee. So they went from about under a, well under a cent to about $2. Yeah, so wouldn't Monero potentially face the same problem if you know, it, it 10x'd in, in price or whatever it may be? Well, it has to 10x in price without any change in the block size. And that is very difficult to do. And this is one of the main things that people raise. The minute you, uh, you increase the price of Monero a factor of 10, you're going to increase the transaction rate, and then you're going to trigger the, the, the dynamic block size. And then what's going to happen is you're going to see this dynamic fee dropping by, by a factor of um, essentially twice as much. I'm sorry, the square of it. So you're going to see the square going up. That's what you're going to see. So it's going to mitigate that. So yes, you might see a tenfold increase in, in Monero prices and, and fees go up by a factor of three or something. The other thing to bear in mind is we still saw very low fees. So even if you had like a hundredfold, we might see fees go up tenfold. So you could be still hitting 10 cents. And then it corrects back down on the median set or whatever. But one thing I will say, it's very important to give it freedom to breathe with a long-term median. Uh, so you have the growth in there. So this is very important for Monero to ensure that that's happening. So we've got to be careful with the parameters. It's not as simple as it meets the eye. But my opinion is the way with the proposal that's currently, you know, going to for the next card fork, that we should be pretty much, in, uh, pretty much under control. Yeah, exci exciting to see the transaction volume grow so much. Um, do you think maybe it was, you know, uh, potentially a, a network attack, I know, are some of the theories that, that people have thrown around? I don't think so. A lot of people are very afraid of spam attacks, and they should be, because with a privacy, it's very, you gotta be careful how you're pricing and all that. But what I've seen is a trend of about two to three times, going back to about 2019, and if that continues, we're gonna trigger the, the normally, we're gonna trigger the, um, dynamic block size in about a year, or maybe under a year. Now, here's the thing. If there's a sudden increase in the price of Monero, this trend will be broken on the upside. This is exactly what happened in 2016, and you saw transaction rates in Monero go up by a factor of 10. In a very short period of time, about a three month period. And if you look at the, uh, the shot into, uh, uh, from there, and that's when Monero way went really up in, in price, so that can happen. So I'm assuming that this sort of sideways market continues. If there is a breakout on the upside, then we will see a significant increase in transaction rates. Yeah, we'll see dynamic block size in oh, action. Yeah, now, yeah, I don't know why I was mistaken. I, th I thought we did hit it recently. That, that's why. But I guess, uh, have we, so we haven't even really gotten close to triggering dynamic block size yet. We're at about, um, I would say 40% of it right now. We have, we did, but uh, so that's where we are right now, roughly. So long term, what does it look like in terms of the usability of Monero on chain? I mean, what, you know, who, who, who knows how many people are actually using, but let's say, you know, we get to that point 
ideally where you know uh, hundreds of millions of people are transacting with Monero. What would the f what would the fee structure or what would the fees look like under such scenario? I know I know it's hard to say. I mean, price is obviously going to be completely different than what it is today. But is the idea that it would all kind of balance out to the point where fees would effectively stay no low enough to still be used as a transactional uh, currency? The exact opposite. Fees are likely fall. Right. Significant. Well, they would, significant. Well, not opposite. The fee, that's what I'm saying. The fees will stay low, if not go lower. Is what no, they saying. will go low. I, I'd be surprised if they stay the same. Um, in fact, what I would expect to, ha to see happen is a significant drop in fees. So what's going to happen uh, with the proposal, you know, goes in the hard fork, fees will go up by a factor of five initially, and that just makes it to, to hit that dynamic fee following the square. And so you go from about 0.2 cents if prices stay the same to about a cent for the low fee, the minimum fee. And then what I would expect it to do is on average that fee in real terms will go down. Because at this stable growth is likely going to just follow the quadratic and the price is likely to increase but not as much as just a straight square of the block size. So what's going to happen is you're going to see fees drop mm. so significantly. So just to, to my own understanding, so the rate of, of fees is going to be falling faster probably than the rate at which the, the, the price of Monero goes up and thus fees, the real world cost of fees is probably going to go down over time as, as more transactions are, are jammed into a block. That is correct. But here's what I expect would happen. The, the rate of fees in terms of Monero will fall as the square of the block size. The price could go somewhere between linear, sorry, uh, linear and in the square of the block size in the other direction. So what you will see is in, say, in terms of, say, 2020 USD, you will see a drop in fees. In terms of Monero, you'll see a very significant drop in fees. That's what I would expect. And it could be quite significant. You know, you could go down from, say, 0.2 cents to, say, 0.02 cents. Now... The cost of spamming the network will go up in real terms. So that's the, the dynamic. And the reason for that is that the cost of spamming the network, you have to fill the entire block. And you have way more transactions to fill at a much higher price. So when you factor that in, the most likely scenario is a drop in the ham, either regular usage fees, and an increase in the spam cost. Sounds uh, too good to be true. That's what I'm trying to work and make it look like. But that's why you have to tune the whole thing to get it to behave in this manner. That's the idea. Yeah. No, it's, it's a, a, obviously a, a beautiful design, um, and it's exciting to see. Um, it's, uh, it always strikes me that you don't hear Monero being spoken about as a blockchain that's built to scale. You know, everybody talks about... Uh, the privacy that's baked into it, it's fungible on the protocol level, obviously extremely important things that we care about and, and that are a very unique to Monero, but also unique to Monero is its ability to essentially scale on the protocol level as well. It has effectively sidestepped the blocking debate. And the reason it sidesteps the, 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 the Bitcoin block size debate is because what it's done is put, by putting the Taylor machine, you no longer have the problem the, the, the fees have to replace the, the emission, the block rule. So once you get that out of the way, then, th then it works. What happened historically in Monero is when we went to confidential transactions and ELMSAG and then we went to uh, uh, Bulletproof. Before we went to Bulletproof. What happened is that fees in Monero approached those of Bitcoin. So nobody, wait a minute, you know, 13 kilobyte transactions, this thing isn't scaling. And, and so that narrative kind of stuck for a while. But now what happened is we've got bulletproofs, we've got CLSAG, we've got all these other little things being added, uh, optimizations. So now we're really competitive and suddenly Monero fees oh. are falling. Now I would expect that coins like Bitcoin Cash particular are gonna have a real problem because they cannot, they can have to compete with Monero without the subsidy. So. For the next seven years, they're going to be doing really well. They're fine. But once that block emission starts to fall in relative terms below what Monero is at, 
then you have one that's subsidized by the block reward and one that's not. And that, I think, is a problem for a lot of Bitcoin-like coins, particularly those who are aiming for, um, they're aiming to compete in this model of competing for fees. The one exception is Dogecoin, um, because they do have a tail emission, so they could do something there. But, um, so yeah, Monero will become a very fierce competitor in the fee market, in my opinion. Are any other coins, do you think, built to scale as well in terms of being a transactional currency? Mm -hmm. I know you mentioned Doge, but that's just because of its tail emission, right? They don't, they don't have dynamic block size and things like that. No, they haven't done anything with it. You need tail emission to scale in a POW coin. I don't care. I know the guys in Bitcoin SV claim that they can do this. I don't buy it. Um, Doge could basically, if they wanted to, all they had to do is take the entire structure from Monero and put it into Doge. The one thing to understand about this, you can, if you develop a scaling model in a, in a private coin like Monero, you can move it into a coin like Bitcoin or Dogecoin. You can't go the other way because of the spam risk. So the tougher nut to crack is actually Monero. The reason that these other coins can't do it, and it's including things like Bitcoin Cash and Bitcoin, etc., is because they don't have the tail emission. Because without the tail emission, your security is gone. And I even hear people saying, well, wait a minute, if we drop free, security is gone. Well, no, in Monero, that's not a problem. But in Bitcoin, it most definitely is. And it's a serious problem in things like Bitcoin Cash and Litecoin, etc. They're trying to f compete in this market, but they haven't really addressed this question. I've heard you recently talk about Monero effectively uh, being a second layer on Bitcoin via atomic swaps or, or vice versa. Essentially, both coins working together through uh, atomic swaps, perhaps Monero being the transactional currency and Bitcoin, you know, being there as providing liquidity. It's definitely something as possible because if you're looking at the most successful second layer solution in Bitcoin today, it's not Lightning Network, well, it's not liquid, it's actually fiat banking. And Monero could do that because basically what you have is you have a decentralized way of moving between the chains. Monero's fees are going to be very, very low. Your only risk, your only cost there big time is your fees on the Bitcoin side. That you have to pay for. And so that's going to be the limitation, but you definitely could get a second layer effect using atomic swaps to transact on Monero. And quite interestingly, with things like uh, Taproot on Bitcoin, you also have a fairly, you know, the Bitcoin transaction that looks like a regular Bitcoin transaction. You have privacy on the Monero side. So this is going to be a pretty private way to move back and forth. Um, so that's the, so yeah, it's definitely possible. One of the challenges still with Bitcoin Monero's atomic swaps is it's only one way right now. So there's, there is some work that has to be done on the Monero side to make this actually work. So in both ways. But yes, definitely Monero could be a second tier uh, network to Bitcoin, absolutely. All right, Francisco, always a pleasure. I know, I know you were talking a lot, so I, I won't uh, carry it on for too long. Is there anything else you want to mention to the Monero community? Yeah. Things, may, perhaps things you're excited about uh, in Monero that are around the corner? Well, the main thing I'm excited about right now is the next hard fork and implementing the fee changes that were proposed. I mean, I think that's really going to help in a big way. I'm very excited to, to, to hear what's going to happen between Triptech and some of the discussions with things like um, Lelanto Spark, uh, some of the options there. Um, there's been some work also being done to make um, certain aspects of the rest of the transaction more efficient. So anything that makes a transaction smaller and more efficient excites me. Because what that means is fees go down. And this. This, this process that I'm talking about accelerates and puts Monero in an even stronger competitive position to do this. So this is why you know, I have the comments whether it's a big change, such as, for example, um, going, from going to bulletproofs to small incremental things such as CLSAG and all this other thing, and Bulletproofs Plus, and all this is adding up. What it's doing is it strengthening Monero um, from a fee perspective. The other important thing is I think we really need to increase the block size, uh, sorry, the, the ring size, 
And the reason for that is that's the most efficient way to deter spam attacks, particularly things like uh, um, flood XMR. And something like even the kind of numbers I was talking about for Cryptek, for example, those numbers will basically make, well, it, it, flood XMR is totally impossible today, but it's just gonna be really, really impossible. So that's the thing I find exciting. The other thing I find exciting on a general sense, I believe that blockchain surveillance, I mean, the kind of thing these chain companies, does not scale at all. It's order of n factorial in the number of outputs in a blockchain. So governments are going to have to give up on this. And that's your, you're not e even just, even with Bitcoin, or you're just no, 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 even with Bitcoin, even with Bitcoin. In fact, a really interesting one to watch is going to have to be the the uh, uh, Chinese. Um, uh, digital centralized currency, uh, central bank currency, because they're going to have real problems if they try to surveil everything. And I suspect what they're going to try and do is set a, a, low, a threshold below which they don't do any surveillance. Otherwise, they're not going to work. But that's a very interesting one to watch. Interesting. So you're saying you're saying uh, surveillance of the Bitcoin blockchain isn't very scalable. The ch chain out chain analysis not scalable at all. And, uh, and even worse than something like Ethereum, just with the existing level of privacy on those chains. If you add, say, on Ethereum what Railguns do, it's a perfect example, um, the right across there, the, or what Monero has done with Bitcoin, it just makes the, um, the, the difficult super impossible. But they are losing a battle even without these uh, add-on technologies, with these extra technologies. I guess I will ask one more question since, uh, um, wh what do you think of Monero? I know, I know we, whenever I talk to you, we normally don't talk about things like price, but what do you think about Monero versus the other cryptos right now? Obviously, you know, we're, we're seeing, you know, transaction volumes, nice or organic rise there, steadily rise. We're seeing, we're assuming it's, it's due to real world use. We know Monero works as digital cash. Why is it, uh, so undervalued compared to these other cryptos that people don't even really use beyond speculation? I basically look at the long term. I mean, in many ways, I look at 2015. All these great things were done in Monero. Nothing was happening. All of a sudden, it took off. Honestly, I don't know. In the short term, I honestly can't answer the question. In the long term, I'm a very strong fundamental believer in Monero, which means give it time and we're going to see some significant movement and on the upside. But... As to when, like, I mean, every time I've tried to trade, like, on a short-term basis, any cryptocurrency, not just Monero, I've lost money. So my approach is buy and hold. That's how I've made money. Trying to trade these things, yeah. not for me. I, I couldn't agree more. Uh, it's, it's, it's a good lesson. Uh, buy and hold, don't, don't trade. Take your Monero off exchanges. What do you think of those rumors that perhaps it's from exchanges selling paper Monero, Monero that they don't actually have? Okay, here's an interesting point that people are missing in this discussion. I suspect if an exchange is doing that, if they've got any common sense, if they're trying to short, they're not just shorting Monero, they're shorting probably 20 or 30 altcoins. So what's gonna happen is they might take a loss on Monero, but they'll be able to cover their positions. I don't think this is going to break an exchange, not, not the market cap Monero has right now. But they may end up hedging it with Bitcoin Satoshi Vision or something, or Dash or something else, and they make their money there. Those have dropped, but Satoshi Vision has dropped a lot. So they can hedge it with something else. And so they've got a whole bunch of altcoins. Most of them have gone down relative to Bitcoin. The few have not, and there's a few exceptions. Dogecoin took off, broke the, the pattern fairly recently. Ethereum has broken it and Monero has broken it. But, so you might take losses on those few that break, but the majority of them have followed this falling pattern. So if you short 20 altcoins and you make money on 18 of them, and two of them make, take a loss, you're going to come out ahead. So I think people should basically, if they're concerned, they should put their re requests in place, give them time to figure out how to honor them, but I, I believe most of these exchanges will end up honoring them. Take your money off the exchange, but don't take it in another currency. Take it in Monero. And if they're going to delay for a while, give them a chance to get their act together. Let them honor the, the, the commitment.
All right. Francisco, thank you, man. You're very welcome. I'll, I'll see you at the party tonight. You bet. All right. Thank you. Thank you for joining us on this week's episode. We release new episodes every week. You can find and subscribe to the show on iTunes, Spotify, Stitcher, Google Play, YouTube, or wherever you listen to podcasts. And if you have an Alexa device, you can tell it to listen to the latest episode of the Monero Talk podcast. Go to monerotalk.live slash subscribe for a full list of places where you can watch and listen. If you want to interact with us, guests, or other podcast listeners, you can follow us on Twitter. And please leave us a review on iTunes. It helps people find the show, and we are always happy to read them. So thanks so much, and we look forward to being back next week.